Welcome to the Lentil Intervention Podcast, raising awareness and inspiring action for personal and planetary health with your hosts, Ben and Emma. Hello, everybody. My name is Ben Adelberg. And I'm Emma Strutt. And welcome to Season 2, Episode 38. Please make sure you hit the subscribe button, share this podcast, and also visit our website where you'll find the full show notes with links, plenty other content, as well as the reasons why we need your support for us to be able to fulfill our goals of delivering community outreach programs. A mouthful there. Um, Emma, we're back with the Drift Lab for another exciting conversation with two more women in STEM, which, by the way, stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math, which I didn't even know before our first conversation. So let's take this away. No. I've learned something already. Um, yeah, that's right. So this is the third episode where we're joined by members of the fantastic team at Adrift Lab from the University of Tassie. Um, today we're joined by Bianca Keys and Carly Milius. These two ladies are currently completing their studies. So Bianca is an honours candidate and Carly is completing her master's and their projects with Adrift Lab see them working on microplastics in shorebirds. So ladies, thank you for joining us. Looking forward to the conversation today. Thank you very much. Thanks for having us, Ben and Emma. Good. Uh, now, uh, ladies, um, you can decide who goes first. Um, we always like to start our, our conversations with a backstory. Uh, you're both, uh, as Emma's mentioned, you're both, well, one's honours, one's um, master's student. Uh, tell us about your interest in science, why you studied what you studied, um, and how you ended up with a drift lab. So... I completed my undergraduate up in Townsville, Queensland at James Cook University. Um, I did it in zoology, um, always loved animals, obsessed with animals since a really young age. Um, and, and yeah, so after I completed that, I actually took a bit of a detour once I, I went traveling for a little bit and moved back to to Melbourne and worked in a corporate industry for like five years. Um, so a bit of a detour for me uh, and then realized how much I missed um, being out in nature and also science was really where I wanted to head. Um, so that's when I found the master's program in IMAS um, and pretty much moved down between lockdowns. I missed out on the stage four lockdown in Melbourne by literally a day. I got here and the day after stage four lockdown happened in Melbourne. So I feel super lucky about that. Um, and how I came about a drift lab, I found the project in Shorebirds um, just online and it was the only one looking at birds um, with my zoology background and then also the microplastics. I thought I looked into that a bit and such a hot topic at the moment. There's so much going on in that area. So yeah, I reached out to Jen Lavers, um, our supervisor, and it, yeah, just took it from there. Um, so I'm actually from Queensland. I did my bachelor's in animal ecology up there. Yep, giving some waving arms there. <laughs> and actually to our listeners, because we, we've done this badly, because this is only audio, this is now Bianca talking. So Carly's from Townsville. Um, down to Melbourne, now in Hobart. So she's see, she's obviously a bit of a, a, a travelling. I was from Melbourne, actually, but I went up to Townsville for my undergrad. I like to move around. Okay, so we know where your loyalties <laughs> lie in, in, in rugby league <laughs> then. Um, right, so Bianca. Um, so, yeah, I did my undergraduate in Queensland there in animal ecology. Um, but a bit of, bit of a backstory before that. I, like Carly, had always loved animals and wanted to work with them. Um, but was desperate for a job at the time. So I interviewed for a finance position and in the interview they said, what is it you really want to do? What's your dream job? And maybe a bit too honest, I said, oh, I'd love to work with animals and conservation. And despite that, I still got the job, but um, I could never forget <laughs> my passion. Um, Who was more desperate there, you for the job or them to get someone on board? Um, let's just go with 50-50. Thanks, <laughs> <laughs> there. Um, but yeah, when I, that passion for animals never went away. And so a few years later, I, uh, handed in my resignation and told them what I was going to do, which was return back to university. And they said, oh, they remembered my interview and said, well, you've come full circle now. So did my undergrad and like you, Emma, actually, I heard of Jen through watching Blue the film. And I thought, oh my goodness, you know, I've always loved seabirds. They hold a special, special key to my heart. 
And so I thought oh, it would be fantastic to work with her and I love the cold. So Tasmania was a very big drawing card for me. So again, like Carly, I saw the project online and emailed Jen and yeah, here I am. Here we both are. Brilliant. Yeah. Now, I mean, it is pretty much the end of semester. So a lot of students and potential students are starting to think about what they'll, you know, want to be doing next year. So a drift lab seems like a really fantastic opportunity for a lot of students to get involved with. So tell us a little bit more about your experience um, with the drift lab so far. Well, um, it's a small team, but everyone's really close. Um, everyone helps each other out uh, where, yeah, where we need any questions or anything like that. Um, we're also, like, because thanks to Jan, we always have these amazing opportunities. For example, um, just was it last oh. month, we went away for a community weekend helping with beach cleanups. Um, and there's all these amazing opportunities to do with um, plastics. Hmm. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's just it's such a tight knit group. I feel like yeah. we've already made really lifelong friends just in the beginning. Um, we're a really collaborative group. Um, it's super supportive, and I have spoken to other students. I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but that just don't have that support yeah. along their journey in doing honors and masters. Um, and just having even Bianca with me, like we can bounce ideas off each other and talk to each other if we've got any any questions, like problems or anything, just for support. And I feel like that's so important for any students looking for, you know, projects, especially their postgraduate. Um, you know, the supervisor and the team that you're going to be working with is like probably the most important thing, actually. So, yeah. Yeah. I, one of the things I was looking for in a supervisor was a mentor. And I think it's safe to say we found that in both Jack and Jen. Yeah. Um, that relationship is definitely, I would say, more than just supervisor students. So I feel that's really important. Yeah. And what's really interesting is that both of you have come through a similar path that you first went into the corporate world. You got corporate city jobs. Um, you didn't follow what would be a more traditional uh, path that you start studying, you continue studying, researching until you're done. Um, you left your studies. You went and got a job, got good money probably compared to what unfortunately it is, you know, doing what you're doing now and, and still decided, no, my passion, where my passion lies is where I've got to go. So it kind of gives a bit of inspiration in the sense that it's never too late, is it? Absolutely. I'm 32. So if that gives anyone a bit of hope, that is never too late to go back and follow your dreams. Um, absolutely not. Yeah. yeah. No, the, our pathways are never A to Z. They're not yeah. linear. Life, <laughs> life is not linear. Yeah. 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 I can contest with that, Emma. I think you'll, you'd say the same. <laughs> we're both, we're both still studying bits and pieces, so it just never ends, does it? But mm, yeah. really exciting with the Drift Lab. Now, um, am I right in saying that you, you, you got a scholarship, you, you got into, into or some support, you got into a Drift Lab, but COVID has also kind of hampered some of the, the work you should be doing or some of the, the, the field trip you should be undertaking? Um. I feel like in, here in Tasmania, we're pretty lucky. Like mm -hmm. we, the field work that I'll be doing for my project, specifically going out to beaches, um, collecting shorebird guano, isn't hindered at all, actually. We do have to like um, fill out extra OHS forms, COVID safety, that kind of thing. Um, but at this point, unless there's an outbreak in Tassie, we're all good. <laughs> yeah. And I, while I'll be helping Carly with her field work, I don't necessarily have any. So, um, I've got all my samples essentially, so I'm not hindered too much by COVID, but we're pretty lucky in Tasmania. Yeah. 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 Same as Queensland. I, I don't understand how we've been so lucky to be honest, but I'm not <laughs> complaining. Um, yeah. So tell us, tell us a little bit more about your projects and it sounds like it's a good mix of like hands-on and then also some lab work. Am I right in that? Or... Yeah. 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 So for mine, um, I will be heading out, actually, currently I'm heading out to beaches around um, Hobart and collecting the, the guano. So I literally sit there with binoculars or a telescope and watch the birds until one of them <laughs> makes a precious, a precious deposit. And then <laughs> I, I go and collect So you're scooping up poo, basically. 
Yes. <laughs> Putting and, a fancy spin on it, though, Ben. God, don't take the tone no, of the conversation no. down. I Smart. feel like I need to have a little picture of a golem, you know, with his little like. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> precious. <laughs> I'm just thinking a typical dog walker. Dog does its business, then up comes the owner with a plastic bag around, a yeah. plastic bag around the hand, and there they are scooping it yeah. all up. <laughs> I yeah, mean, it's really, yeah. that's what it is. A lot it? less stinky though. <laughs> <laughs> and smaller. Yes. Yeah. But I was quite afraid at the beginning. I wasn't too confident how that was going to go, like whether I was going to see the birds actually do it um, mm. and whether it would get lost in the sand, for example. I had no idea, but um, it has, I went out for some test runs and you can actually see them do it if you've got some good binoculars. Um, and then it's just quite a, a solid round like piece of guano and it's so easy to just go and collect but <laughs> fingers crossed I'm not jinxing myself and <laughs> it'll stay like that but yeah so far so good yeah um so the end results will be very similar for Carly and I um the only difference is I'm mainly doing dissections of seabirds that have previously been collected so Megan who you heard from a couple of weeks ago she's actually generously um let me use the birds that she collected from lord howe island um and i've gotten some other so i'm studying two different shearwater species um the flesh-footed from lord howe and then the short-tailed from around tasmania um so yeah i've got all my samples and done all my dissections so tell us about the birds uh, is there a particular reason why you select those particular birds um is it because of their migratory uh, migration routes is it because you know of of that's where they spend more time on that particular beach or island if they come from Lord Howe, uh, Lord Howe Island. Um, is, is there a, a, a sort of a reason to that? Uh, yeah, so we're actually very lucky. These two species of shearwaters, um, you get a lot of sea, seabirds that where they nest can be high up on cliff faces, so it's really hard to access, or their burrows are, you know, three metres deep. Um, but with the shearwaters that we're studying, we have quite a bit easier access to them. Um, and the birds that we're collecting samples from are actually fledglings, um, usually around 80 to 90 days old. So they're, they're out of the nest. Um, and unfortunately, we get those from being beach washed um, when they've passed away. So it sounds sad, but that's how I get my samples. Um, and yeah, Jen has been doing extensive research on Lord Howe Island for many years now. Um, so that's where those birds come from. Um, and for my study species, I, it's actually the two shorebird, they're resident shorebirds, so they remain in Australia annually. They don't migrate. Um, I mean, they might migrate, say, as far as Victoria to Tasmania, maybe, but that's as far as they'll go. Um, and those are the hooded plover and the Australian oyster catcher, pied oyster catcher, sorry. Um, and they're more a case study. Um, specifically because they're coastal. So we know a bit about um, how seabirds can transfer plastic pollution, um, but we really don't know much at all about coastal environments. Um, so that's why the shorebirds are a really good indicator for that. Define for us what, what the difference is between shorebirds and seabirds. Because, uh, you know, a layman like me would have initially thought, same thing right it's a bird flies over the ocean maybe or you know is there there is a difference right um and and do they provide different data i guess um yes yeah, so for seabirds um they are reliant on the ocean for pretty much a good part of the year um for the shearwaters for example they don't return to land for the first five years after they first fledged so they spend First five years out of the ocean, don't touch land again until they're ready to breed for the first time. Um, so they're mainly true pelagic species. Um, and shorebirds, as Carly? Yeah, shorebirds are not pelagic. So shorebirds are on, basically live on the coastlines, um, on beaches, wet, wetlands, estuaries, that kind of thing. Um, so they don't go out into sea. They might, you know, be found swimming or something, but they don't live out in sea at all. Um, so they have two different habitats basically um so yeah it's being able to compare how the plastics are transferred through the marine environment but shorebirds is interesting because um beaches for example are a mixture it's like an intertidal food web so it's, it's a mixture of marine and terrestrial um and i'll go into this a bit later on maybe but um 
yeah, it's kind of bringing those in together and seeing whether animals that are still on land are being affected by all of that plastic that's found in the ocean. Do we know at this stage with the data that's been, um, you know, put out by a drift lab, which kinds of birds are actually ingesting more microplastic? Well, we don't have any data on shorebirds at all. Yeah. This- ah, okay. Yeah. yeah. So you're really, really leading the way. Yes. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. And there's been quite a bit of data for seabirds with larger plastic items um, from the stomachs, but in terms of micro and nanoplastics, there is very little research on that. So explain to us the whole concept of ingestion of both micro and macro plastics. I mean, one's more than the other, obviously. Um, but what what actually happens? Why why are birds ingesting it? Why are they mistaking it for food? Um, what what don't we understand about this whole process? So it's been documented that plastic has been ingested, sorry, ingested or found across our marine food webs from our smallest organisms like phytoplankton and zooplankton, um, but it slowly makes its way up the food chain um, and it's present in our top marine predators like seabirds and shorebirds. Um, but there's generally two types of ingestion. So you've got primary and secondary. So firstly, plastic items that are mistakenly eaten as food is a primary source of ingestion. That's true for both larger macroplastics and also the smaller microplastics. There's actually estimates that around 5.25 trillion pieces of plastic are floating in the top 10 centimetres of the ocean. And unfortunately, most types of plastics don't actually biodegrade. Um, So instead, they break down into smaller and smaller pieces from UV exposure and by wave wave action, sorry, for example. And they're so small that they're invisible to the naked eye, becoming micro and nanoplastics. And unfortunately, these plastics uh, accumulate what's called a biofilm, essentially making them smell and taste like food. And for seabirds that have a range of feeding strategies, such as surface feeding or different diving techniques, uh, it seems pretty easy to understand why they can accidentally ingest some of these particles directly from the ocean. Um, Another way is plastic already ingested by smaller prey um, can then be eaten as a secondary source, again, working its way up the food chain, um, which is also known as biomagnification. However, once inside the bird, um, these larger plastics can actually be partially digested. Uh, so birds have two stomachs. The first is the proventriculus, uh, it's a tricky word, um, but that's similar to our stomach and produces the digestive enzymes uh, that start to break down the food. Um, the second is the gizzard, and this is responsible for the mechanical digestion since birds don't have teeth like us. And the food can actually pass back and forth between these two stomachs until it's ready to move on. Um, And the same can happen for these plastics that they've eaten. Um, Those large items can then break down again into smaller and smaller pieces and become microplastics. And the ones small enough can actually pass through the bird as guano or as poo, um, while the bigger pieces actually stay inside the bird. Um, And following on from that with shorebirds, they're also a top predator, but as I mentioned before, they're top predators of coastal habitats, um, beaches, estuaries, wetlands, that kind of thing, um, which are, as I said earlier, as ecosystems with a mix of marine and terrestrial elements. So they live on the land, however, their main diet consists of marine macroinvertebrates, such as bivalves, um, clams, marine worms, crustaceans, things like that, um, which live in the shore sediment. And we would call this an intertidal food web. Um, and as microplastics are highly abundant in all marine ecosystems, they're commonly found to have been eaten by invertebrates. Um, and as Bianca mentioned earlier, they will make their way up the food chain into high levels of the food chain, <laughs> making shorebirds particularly susceptible to ingesting them, the microplastics. Um, and the ingestion through prey is called secondary or indirect indigestion, ingestion. I know Bianca already said that. <laughs> And, <laughs> and the alternative, there's also another alternate pathway for microplastics to reach shorebirds, um, which is directly by the sediment. 
like seabirds ingesting plastics directly from the ocean surface water. For example, when shorebirds forage, they probe into sediment, they might be successful and catch a prey item, um, or maybe not, but either way, they've likely ingested some sediment, which is itself could contain many microplastics. There've been studies that report so many microplastics found in just like one meter square of surface sediment on a beach, for example. Um, and also another thing with the study species that we've chosen, the shorebirds, um, the hooded plover is a small bird. It's got a really small beak and the Australian pied oyster catcher has a much longer bill, longer bill, and therefore they're probing at different depths in the sediment. Um, so being able to compare, you know, the amount of plastics consumed by both of those birds could show how um, whether, yeah, this transfer through the sediments is actually affecting their ingestion or not, um, or maybe it's just through prey um, alone, but yeah. Uh, it sounds like really important work. It's kind of like these birds are the canary in the coal mine, so to speak, like that'll give us a really good indicator of how everything else is being effect affected by, by these plastics. Yeah, yeah it, exactly. And I, I really love that analogy. Um, it's something that everyone can understand and yeah seabirds and shorebirds are considered you know marine sentinels for the health of our oceans ecosystems so question then i'm playing a bit of devil's advocate here um i've drunk my can of coke i've chucked it in the bin but it ends up in the in the ocean anyway why why should i care really about the birds why, why does it matter to me what's happening to the birds in regards to plastic so in seabirds, bigger plastics, such as a can of Coke, um, can cause blockages. Obviously, the can of Coke itself, the seabird might not be able to ingest, but it's likely going to break up at some point. Um, little bits are going to break off. And yeah, it can cause blockages or perforations in the digestive tract. Um, by staying in the stomach, plastic gives no nutritional value either, um, but makes the bird feel full. So that leads to starvation and all of that also leads to death very often. Um, and while microplastics themselves may seem harmless, um, when they reach nano sizes, which is under 0 0.1 micrometers, um, and for some perspective, a micrometer is a thousandth of a millimeter and one millionth of a meter. Um, so Still means micro... nothing. Basically, basically, we can't see it. <laughs> really small. <laughs> yeah, it's unfathomably tiny. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, and so the microplastics that reach the size are, and basically the, the can of Coke is going to reach this eventually because it's, yep. it's not, yeah. And the microplastics that reach this size are actually small enough to pass through cell membranes, which is frightening. Mm -hmm. um, this alters cellular function um, and performance and can accumulate in organs as well. Yeah, which, as I said, is really scary. And perhaps animals such as birds, as well as humans, our organs are very large compared to these um, nanoparticles, so likely able to handle higher concentrations before serious health implications begin. Um, however, that threshold of how much is too much is not yet known and would be different for different species. Um, so it's a really complex question and we, we don't, other than the larger plastics, actually seeing them cause suffocation and starvation, entanglement, all of that, the microplastics, it's a lot harder for us to know exactly how they're affecting the animals. Um, and yeah, this is where all this research is coming in. But that's a, that's a really important point you raised there. Like if it's in the birds, it's in our food system as well. So we'd be ingesting it and, and we just oh, don't absolutely. know yet, like what, what that means for us. So like your yeah. work really, really important. Yeah. I don't know if it's because we are larger. Um, it's just it takes longer for us to see the effects, you know. Um, but well, I mean, the, the, the conversation we've had with Dr. Jack Orty not, not that long ago, I mean, we spoke about the effects of, of microplastic on human health, on our immune system, on the inflammation it causes. So, yeah. um, you know, I guess we do know a little bit. It's just that, A, do we ignore it because plastic is everywhere? Um, or, you know, or it's, it's still not as understood, but with smaller creatures, you know, we, we've learned what it does. We've learned with, with Megan and, and, and Gabrielle that, you know, the entanglement issues it causes and, um, and nesting, um, but also the effects that by ingesting plastic, you're filling up on plastic. So there's no room for actual nutrients. You're not deriving the nutrients. And, and mutton birds, for instance, we, we've had the real emotional s story of how a lot of them don't even get to leave land. 
um, and that's it. That's done for them. So it, it, it is. It's heartbreaking, but it's 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 a real reality check, isn't it? Yeah, and although we have only scratched the surface on the impacts uh, microplastics are having, as you mentioned, research on smaller plastics, nanoplastics specifically, um, as you said, has suggested that the greater surface area can increase toxic, uh, toxicity as well mm. um, and increases in inflammation, as you mentioned, Dr. Jack already described. Um, and this inflammation could cause other complications, of course. Um, also, there have been quite a few studies on impacts reported on the smaller marine organisms. Um, so it's not just the bigger animals, uh, invertebrates especially, algae, bacteria, and fish as well. For example, some studies found changes in growth rates, um, effects on fertility, cell viability, metabolic activity, and a whole range of other health implications. So yeah, it's really likely they are having some impact on larger animals as well. Just we haven't seen it yet. So when we think of plastic in the ocean, um, we immediately link this with its transport from land. Uh, what we don't often think about is the reverse of this process. Um, so how are the plastics ending back up on land, on remote islands and beaches? And obviously this can occur from currents and wind and waves washing them on shore. Um, but we're recently realizing the role both seabirds and shorebirds play in depositing such plastics. And as you heard from Megan and Gabby last week, um, there are different ways that seabirds can deposit the plastics on their breeding sites um, from their decomposing carcasses to incorporating them in their nests. Uh, but something else that's interesting is as we're studying their poo, um, and as we saw, said, sorry, as we said before, um, particles that are small enough will pass directly through the bird and be excreted. Um, but what we really want to know is, is this actually happening and how much is there? So, so on that, um, because Carly, you're looking at what's in the poo, so what's passed through the body, but Bianca, you're actually dissecting the birds. Um, do you find there's a correlation between you know, what's being ingested can actually be measured what's been outputted or is it necessary to study both um, to actually piece it all together? You know, how, how does that, what kind of data does that present? Yeah, so as we said, there's so, sorry, there's very limited data on this, um, but the study, there has been a study that looks at the stomach contents, so the bigger pieces of plastic and compares that to the guano essentially. Um, looking for microplastics and if, if that is an indicator. Uh, unfortunately, they didn't really see a correlation between what's found in the stomach is what's going to end up in the poo, or the guano, I should say. Um, but yeah, that's only one study. So we need a lot more data before we can definitively say if we can use guano as a non-invasive measure to see how much plastic is in these birds. Yeah. Yeah. It's like it's unlikely we'll find larger plastics in the guano. Um, it's they're most likely going to be the smaller plastics, and these smaller particles are actually the ones that are that tend to be underestimated in such studies. Um, so yeah, we're also testing, hoping to test out this methodology, and it um, it's also non-invasive, which is a big reason mm -hmm. why I did choose this project as well. Um, I I always wanted to be proud of the project I was doing and the way I was doing it and um, obviously be as non-invasive to the animals as possible. So trying to see whether studying these kinds of things, such as microplastics in guano um, and whether it's viable, um, yeah, could just open up doors for future research as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, you both only started mid-year, correct me if I'm wrong here, but like how far along the process are you at the moment? When can we, you know, get the inside scoop on the findings? Inside scoop. <laughs> I wasn't going to say anything. <laughs> well, thank um, <laughs> So we'll probably have some results, by we're aiming for the end of the year. Um, okay. So hopefully, yeah, once I have my samples, um, we can both go into the lab, um, yeah, maybe November and do our digestion and, you know, count the microplastics, analysis, that kind of thing. So, yeah, we'll be finished in April next year, actually. Yeah. Mm. Ex explain to us, I'm going to use the right term from now on, guanu. 
Um, explain to us how the actual, I mean, we don't need the intricate details, but because it's something new, um, explain to us a little bit about the process. So we know that you've got to basically stalk the birds and identify which one's <laughs> doing what, but are you even taking into context that the size, you know, the, the size of what you're picking up? I mean, is, does that matter? Uh, because is that affected by the ingestion of plastic? You know, it's, it's, uh, like in humans, you know, the more fiber you eat, the more you go as well. And, and that's a sign of, you know, your body's functioning well. Is it the same thing with birds? I mean, the regularity, the size, the weight, because does the plastic change the composition? I know we're going deep, but this could be interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Can I Actually, just say, I never thought we'd be talking about the regularity of, of bird movements on this podcast. Well, it's better question. than talking about I'm regularity. <laughs> that, that could be, ben, that could be a project in itself, honestly, just watching the regular, yeah. Figuring out when they go, how often they go. Sign me up, um, I'm, I'm on board. <laughs> no, not really looking into that for this one. We are, like, I will be weighing the, the guano um, and then obviously attempting to weigh maybe the plastics as well and sort of making the comparisons yeah. that way. Um, but on the, like, knowing whether, at what time they say they're foraging and then they, you know, make a deposit just after they're foraging is that going to be different to whether they did yeah. one when they weren't foraging and funny story actually when we were doing the test sampling they were the two hooded plovers they're, they're always in pairs and they're in mating pairs at the moment um and they were actually mating whilst whilst we arrived there we saw it happen which is amazing in itself um and then we got, we collected a sample from the female bird not long after this. And it was quite a big sample compared to the second one that we got from a pair that we didn't witness mating. So maybe, maybe that was mixed with, oh, this is getting bad actually. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder where you were going yeah. with it. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I'm, I'm backing Kylie up on this. I, I can see you maybe like the, the reason behind it. You know, it's, it's, um, you know, like, like when animals are scared, they, they quickly, they lighten themselves so they can fly away or, or escape. You know, because they've got less yeah. load. So, yeah, maybe you know, again, without going too deep into this, um, maybe there's a relationship to that. You know, maybe it's kind of like. You know, I I'm guess ready. I guess they their <laughs> birds are known birds are known to um defecate when yeah. they are nervous actually yeah. um so that could you know give us different results with microplastics compared to if it was straight after they were foraging um I'm not sure exactly how long it takes for prey to work through the digestive system um whether it's like 24 hours or a couple of days or even shorter I'm not sure but um. Yeah, <laughs> I, 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 there has to be a direct correlation. I mean, it's the same thing with humans. Yeah. I don't know why I keep going back to this, but you know, it, it, the amount of fiber you consume or don't consume has a correlation to that. So the type of food you eat, and and surely has to be the same thing here. If, if they're not eating what they normally eat, how is that impacting their digestive system? You know, how is that actually working? So maybe that's the work that Bianca is going to tell you and say, well, look, opening up these birds and it's blocking. You know, it sounds like a project and... for you, Ben. You sound fascinating yeah. in this. So jump on a plane, fly on over. Hey, anything to do to get out of lockdown right now here in Auckland. So uh, <laughs> seriously, Hobart, is it summary? <laughs> oh, um, no. Yeah, yeah. Okay, now I'm out. <laughs> but no, I, I think this is fascinating, and and um, yeah, we're really looking forward to see what what the outcome of that study is um, and yeah. what it leads to. Yeah. Well, I mean, just to maybe give you a little bit of an idea, I've got a couple of facts here about um, some seabirds in the Northern Hemisphere and how much they found. So a paper uh, by Bordage and et al, um, they were studying two seabirds, as I say, up in the Northern Hemisphere, and they were focusing on the fecal precursor. So it's a technical term, but essentially it's the last portion of the intestines to the anus, basically last little bit of their digestive tract um, and they identified about 24 particles from 27 birds for the first species and then 10 pieces from 30 birds for the other and we're talking microplastics or nanoplastics and these numbers don't sound very impressive or like it's a problem at all but they've actually been able to estimate 
that these two species could be depositing between 3 and 45 million anthropogenic particles per year into the environment at their respective breeding sites. And I want to mention that this is for a single colony in one location for each species, not their entire global population. So you can start to imagine how many nano and microplastics are being deposited around the world by seabirds alone. But to be fair, we're not really blaming them because they're ingesting it in the first place, but no. they're then, but then they're depositing it in a concentrated area. So where they're yes. nesting, so you know, where the colonies yeah. are based. And that's, that's where the bigger problem is because then it becomes this ongoing cycle that if they're feeding, mm -hmm. then it's coming back into the system and the ratio probably gets higher over time. So yeah, exactly, exactly. They're creating these hotspots and sinks for plastics. And no, you're right. We're not blaming the birds at all. It's <laughs> it's unfortunately happening to them without their knowledge. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's just we could do the same study on humans, but that would require a lot more ethics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but the problem with humans is the food that humans eat it, it it's you can't track it i mean you buy it at the supermarket so but where that where did that come yeah. from um whereas yeah. with birds you you can follow their migration paths you can kind of figure out where it's coming from although marine debris well where's that coming from i mean you look at currents and say well maybe it's come from that part of the world but yeah uh, it's it's it really it really does open up, uh, I guess, our, we don't get to see this and we don't, we don't understand. And like Emma said, you know, um, you know, you drink something, you eat something, you put it in the bin, bin overflows, get, gets into a storm water, storm water out into the ocean. And, and that's it. It's forgotten about, but what does that, how does that impact another life or lives down the line? Um, whether it's a month later or five years later, when it's actually broken down into, into those nanoparticles and, got into smaller fish or vertebras or, or, or so yeah it's a real really makes you think about the rubbish yeah. we generate um and what we do that, that's exactly right and just to touch on the seabirds that i'm studying the really sad thing is is that these are these are babies you know they're being mm -hmm. fed these plastics by their parents they have no choice in what they're given you know, they haven't even left the island yet to forage for themselves. So, yeah, as you said, these guys don't even make it off the island. Some of them, they're just, they're starving and they're, they're force fed, unfortunately. Yeah. And, and they're born into this situation. It's just heartbreaking, heartbreaking yeah. to know that this is happening to so yeah. many, not just birds, but animals around the world are getting affected by what we do and how we dispose of our rubbish in our food system and, yeah, I could go on, but I won't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and also these birds are from what very remote locations that you wouldn't that aren't necessarily close to human populations at all. Um, and there's still so much plastic pollution in those areas. So, yeah, we can't escape it, and we can't keep putting it aside. Like we need to do something about it. Yeah. Well, that's the irony, and and we've learnt about the isolation of Lord Howe Island, which I didn't even know where it existed before that last episode. <laughs> um, but that's our, the irony is that a lot of these remote locations end up having uh, more marine debris bumped, uh, dumped onto their, onto their beaches because of currents. Do you mm -hmm. think there could actually be a difference between mainland shore, shore lines, you know, sort of a beach, say, in Hobart, versus um, or maybe a beach in, say, mainland Australia, so along the Queensland coast, say, versus a Lord Howe Island. Do you think there would be a difference there in terms of the amount of plastic that would be deposited on, on a beach? There could be. There was actually a study by Dr. Scott Ling, um, who's at, currently based at IMAS, um, and he looked at sediments, small seafloor sediments, microplastics around Australia, um, and he found the most abundant site, um, I believe, is actually Bishino, which is a pretty pristine small town in Tasmania. And he looked at sites all around the southeast coast of, you know, Victoria, I think South Australia as well. So that goes to show that, and I'm, you know, it's like you said, highly influenced by things like currents um, and not necessarily higher concentrations around, um, you know, human like cities. More built up example. areas, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
And that's potentially part of the problem then, because we're not seeing it. You know, if I go for a walk along the beach, I'm not seeing that immense amount of rubbish because, and, and I'm not exactly going to these remote islands every day. So I don't see it. And the public doesn't see it. If it was more in our face, maybe it would drive us to take more action. Yeah. And that, that's the good thing about our research. Both Carly and I are using local species. They are here. We see them every day. You go to a beach in Tasmania, you're very likely to see a pied oyster catcher. Yeah. So these are in our background, backyard. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think people would expect these birds to be ingesting plastics, um, as you said, because you don't really see. I think we're really lucky in Australia. Um, often, you know, our beaches look quite clean and pristine compared to beaches from overseas, for example. Um, but there are certainly <laughs> microplastics existing there as well. Um, and yeah, it's just to create that awareness that it's under our own, you know, under our own eyes. Mm. And, and again, this comes back to a point that Jack touched on, actually, it's not just the research, it's also about how we translate that to the public. So it's really important to have those educational campaigns and art and like, it's going to be very uh, multifaceted approach, I think, to really get that message out there. Um, but this, this has been a fascinating um, chat. What's mm. plans for you both in the future? Have you caught the research bud now? Are you going on to do PhDs or are you wanting to get out in the field and get some, um, you know, work and be more hands-on? Um, I would love to find work, but PhD tends to be the... <laughs> the way to do that. <laughs> yeah, the way to, well, the way to do that. Um, but since starting this research in microplastics, I'm actually finding the topic on potential health effects um, quite interesting. So, for example, how they may interact with nutrient uptake in wildlife, even humans. Um, so I'm looking at exploring possible PhDs in this in this area, yeah. Yeah. Um, and like you were saying, Ben, about the holistic approach here, you know, ocean currents and what's driving these things. So I would love to pursue a PhD uh, combining oceanography with seabird spatial distributions and foraging ecology and you know tying all this in with the occurrence of plastic ingestion so yeah bit of a goal there but Brilliant. interesting wow now carly and bianca i'm i'm inspired honestly and both what you're currently doing but both your your future interests is is so fascinating i just don't think i'd have the patience to to study or <laughs> sit down and be and do that kind of stuff but it, it's i love reading outcomes of studies like that and it's hugely inspiring we said it right at the beginning of the show and we spoke to megan and gabrielle about the same thing and that is just so exciting to be talking to more women in the space uh you know what used to be a very male dominated area and um and more so that both of you come from a change of career path in a sense you know you, you step back out of the corporate world and back into into this and, and doing such important work so thank you so much for sharing honestly giving us a really good lesson this has been like a free lesson on shorebirds seabirds what they're ingesting and more importantly the guanu that's the final result of that probably saying it wrong anyway so thank you so much for coming on to the show sharing your passion and your story it's been an absolute delight thanks guys thank you very thank you much for having, for having us. us yeah thank you for listening to the lentil intervention podcast make sure you subscribe and share this podcast with your friends and visit the website for more details